Thank you, Oliver, and good morning from me to all of you. My name indeed is Mikko Hyppänen, and uh, we will be speaking about the big picture, speaking about why are we still having all these problems? How come we can't solve these issues? How come we can't understand the enemy better? How come after 20 years, or actually now 21 years of working in this industry, I'm today busier than ever before? When I started analyzing viruses in 1991, it felt like it's going to pass. It felt like, you know, we're going to get rid of these problems. We're going to fix our systems. At the time, the viruses that I was analyzing, viruses like stoned and Jerusalem and so on, actually there was a stoned version called stoned flame, which I just remembered, which is interesting, because flame, of course, is a name for another malware, which we are all excited about, I'm sure. But there was a virus called stoned flame in around 1992. And back then, they were also always infecting these 8-bit or 16-bit operating systems, like Apple IIs and MS-DOS and so on. And these systems were very simple, very rudimentary, and it seemed obvious that we will be able to fix these systems. And eventually, we will have better systems, better secured, and these won't be a problem. And then we got 32-bit operating systems, 64-bit operating systems, and we're still here. We're still fighting malware today, we're still finding vulnerabilities, we're still finding exploits. And people keep asking me about how come we can't fix this, especially people who are like financial people or managers who don't really understand why we have vulnerabilities. Like, why can't we get rid of vulnerabilities? And the way I typically explain it to them is that, well, these vulnerabilities, they're just bugs. They're just bugs, problems. People write these programs and people make mistakes. And of course, these people remember that box used to mean that your system crashed, or your program crashed, or your computer crashed. They'll remember using Microsoft Office, let's say Microsoft Word with Windows 3, and it would crash and they would lose their document. You know, that's what bugs used to mean. But then along came this internet thingy, and this web thingy, and today the very same box, very, very similar box, don't just mean that your application crashes and you lose your document or your computer crashes and you have to reboot. Now, because we are online, those very same bugs mean that potentially the system could be taken over. And sort of you can see a light bulb going off top of their head. Ah, oh, so it's you know, just human problem. It's, it's, it's the coders making mistakes and we'll never be able to fix the coders. But we are seeing some improvement and the one that I'd like to highlight is Apple. No, we all know OS X has its issues. In fact, it now has more malware than ever before. But let's look at iOS. Our iPhones, iPads, iPods. iPhone will be five years old next week. Five years. One of the most visible devices on the planet. Five years, during which time it's been one of the most popular smartphones on the planet. Right now, Apple iPhones are number three after um, Symbian-based devices and Android-based devices, or actually I should say Android-based devices and Symbian-based devices when you look at smartphones globally. So there's no lack of these devices and lots and lots of people have been looking at them, trying to figure out ways to own them. Yet, five years later, the amount of real in the wild malware for iPhone is zero. Not a single one. Yes, we've seen proof of concepts. Yes, we've seen Charlie Miller's demos. That's not a real in the wild malware. Yes, we've seen FlexiSpy. Yes, we've seen um, malware for jailbroken iPhones. But those are for jailbroken iPhones. For real, unmodified iPhones, five years have gone by and nothing has happened. And that is a great achievement. We really should give credit to Apple for a job well done. And this, of course, has a lot to do with the App Store model and a lot to do with the uh, restrictions they've built in place, golden handcuffs, you might say. But the fact remains, they are without malware. It's not going to last forever, but that's the situation right now. So who's this guy? 
Anybody? Einstein. Albert Einstein. It's a great photo. He's having fun with his bicycle. And there's something blowing up in the background. And I wanted to bring this image here to get some perspective of the long run, like what's really happening in our world. Because I claim nuclear physics lost its innocence in 1945. That's when we, the mankind, used it as a weapon. That's when we blew up bombs. And I claim that computer science lost its innocence in 2009. That's Stuxnet. That's when Operation Stuxnet started late 2008, early 2009, with US President George W. Bush signing a cyber attack program against the nuclear program of Iran. So there's some perspective for you. We have attacks like Stuxnet, like Dooku, like Flame, attacks launched by governments, militaries, and intelligence agencies. And we sort of take this now for granted, because we've been speaking about these problems for the last three years, and I'll speak a little bit more about them as well. And we have a presentation about Stuxnet later today, which is, which is great. But just imagine, if somebody would have told you ten years ago that in ten years we will, for real, see cases where governments are writing malware to attack other governments, Governments are writing malware to attack their own citizens. And here I'm especially looking at the Germans using RTD2 to spy on their own people, as well as the totalitarian states in the Middle East. That governments would be moving most of their espionage operations from the real world to the online world with APTs and what have you. And that for real, governments would be attacking the nuclear systems of another government with malware. Ten years ago, if somebody would have told you this, would you have believed it? Because I wouldn't. I would have told you that, you know, that's, that's not going to happen. That's a movie plot. That's a Hollywood story. That's Die Hard 4. And yet, that's exactly what's happening right now for real. There's a lot of talk about cyber war, cyber warfare, cyber arms race. Of course, we don't have a cyber war because wars are wars which are fought between people and nobody has announced a war between different countries. But definitely there is something big going on. But this is of course not the full picture. Not nearly all of the problems are like this. In fact, the most likely mundane problem you're going to run into are the attacks launched by the criminals, the ones who want to make money. And I strongly believe that if we want to have any hope at all in defending against these attacks, we first have to understand the enemy or the enemies. We have to understand who's doing these attacks. We have to understand what do they want. And we have to understand why they're doing these attacks. Because we have completely different attackers. So the way I like the group different attackers is based on their motives, like what makes them tick. And that brings us three main groups. And yes, there are some other fringe groups, but the big split is between criminals, hacktivists, and governments. And I did a study on, for example, the level of skill um, on extremists, like terrorists groups, like real terrorists, like Al-Qaeda and guys like that. Um, I researched this earlier this year and as a result of that research, I'm not including them here. They potentially could be the fourth group, but not yet. Their skills are in the hands of very few individuals with those groups, and there's real no, really no danger at this very moment, as far as I can see, from cyber terrorism. But eventually it could become a fourth group. And of course we have some smaller groups as well. But the big split is, first of all, criminals, the biggest group, the, the most likely one to hit you. Second of all, hacktivists. Third of all, governments. So what's the motive? Well, for criminals, it's very easy. It's money. And everybody understands that as a motive. Money makes the world go around. Money makes people do whatever. And if you can become rich by writing viruses, well, somebody's going to do it, right? And many people are doing it. And this is what makes 
hacktivists different movements like anonymous they are not doing their attacks to become rich they are not looking for money that's the difference they want to some they want to do something else they want to send a message they want to protest or they just do it for the lulls and we have cases where hacktivists have been breaking into places trying to send a message or trying to protest and then they stumble upon something valuable and then they become greedy and then they start stealing for their own benefit and in that case we simply move them from the group of hacktivists to the group of criminals now they just became criminals they're no longer hacktivists and companies get targeted because they do stupid stuff most of the cases where organizations and governments have been targeted with a low orbit ion cannon attacks or targeted uh, hacks by movements like anonymous they were basically asking for it and let me give you just one example let's compare sony to apple i al already gave nice words about apple and i'm not an apple fanboy by any means but let's compare what happened when george hotz hacked sony and when uh comex hacked apple and here i don't mean hack into i mean hack systems built by them george hot wanted to run his own programs on his very own playstation 3 so he rooted his playstation 3 so he could run his own program what did sony do sony sued him what happened people got angry for a very good reason as an end result sony was hacked the last time i looked 37 times right and then the very same thing, Comex wanted to run his own programs on his own iPhone. So he jailbroke his iPhone. What did Apple do? They didn't sue him. Instead, they hired him. Comex is now working for Apple. Good move. Apple has not been hacked 37 times. Instead, Comex is now on their payroll, which means he's no longer making new versions of his jailbreaks and he's now inside Apple telling the Apple people how to fix these things how to make it harder to break the security models of Apple good move and then we have the third group the governments which is completely different and now you can sort of see how it's hopeless to even try to defend against these attacks with the same model because we are com we have completely different attackers with completely different motives the things you do to try to secure your systems against a criminal attacker are completely different from the ones you try to do if you want to defend against a governmental attacker plus criminals want to target pretty much anybody they just want money governments are not going to target you unless you're interesting flame is not going to hit you if you are a normal private citizen it's not going to hit your company if you are a local pizza place you don't have to worry about stuxnet or flame ever because you're not interested you do have to worry about them if you are a government employee for a middle eastern government or if you work for the nuclear program of iran that's completely different so let me give you a couple of examples of of what's happening in the criminal world the mechanisms these guys use to make money well, they started from the botnets, which were used to send spam. Then we got into credit card theft. Most of these stolen with keyloggers from infected Windows computers. Then we got into banking trojans, which will inject extra transactions from an infected Windows computer while you're doing banking. And I keep repeating Windows because almost all of these are Windows computer issues. A couple of mugshots, just to put us into perspective. That's uh, Mr. Alex Maksakov in the white jacket in the courthouse of a small city in southeastern uh, Russia with two of his partners in crime after running denial of service networks with botnets they've built to ask for ransom from companies which websites they were taking down. He's one of the guys behind the goop face, worm against Facebook platform. This is Igor, arrested two months ago in Moscow for running the Carburb operation. Don't remember his guy's name, but he's in Bucharest in, in Romania. And this is Vladimir Chachin from the city of Tarto in Estonia. And Tarto is the second largest um, city in Estonia. And Vladimir 
We first noticed him when he was running this company in around 2005 and 2006. He was running a domain registrar called S Domains and a hosting company called S Host and an internet operator. And this was a criminal internet operator run by criminals for the criminals. So he was, for example, providing bulletproof hosting and domain registration services where if you were a criminal and you needed to have a website, for example, to have exploits to own people, or you wanted to have a website so you could sell stolen credit cards and bank accounts, you know, criminal stuff, you would register his domain and you would host with Vladimir. And he would guarantee that you will stay online. If there were complaints about your website sent by certs or sent by security companies or even by authorities, he wouldn't shut you down. He would only increase your billing, right? So the more stuff you did, the more you generated complaints, the more you had to pay. But if you kept paying, you stayed online. Very clever. He ended up selling around 265,000 domain names, which were basically all sold to online criminals. Which actually, if you will look at Estonian newspapers at the time, this is the top 100 fastest growing IT companies in Estonia. And on number one on the list is a company called Rove Digital OU, which is run by Vladimir. So it's really easy to grow really fast if your business is cybercrime. But this did end when, in December, this bus parked outside of the street address Lau 6 Tarto in Estonia, which was the headquarters for Rove company Vladimir was running. This bus is, this, uh, um, is the forensics bus of the Central Criminal Police of Estonia. And this is the Estonian police carrying out a router, which was the router for an operation we now know as DNS Changer, a.k.a. Operation Ghost Click. And this is the reason why in two weeks or two and a half weeks on the 9th of July, around 100,000 computers around the world will go dark because the DNS changer, DNS infrastructure will be shut down because the FBI court order, which has kept them running the operation even after this operation was shut down, the court order will expire and the DNS network for these infected machines will be shut down. It's right now being run by Paul Vixie from ISC. He's going to switch off the router and uh, these machines will go offline. Another example I wanted to highlight is that there's quite a bit of these guys operating surprisingly out in the open. Yes, sure, some of them go to the deep web, to dot, dot .onion sites in the Tor network or to IP2 web or to Freenet, but ma many of them are in, in completely open forums, in IRCs, in web chats and in YouTube. And here's this one guy called Kvabo. Let me run a video he, he has on his site. I am promoting Guapo's professional DDO service. We are here to provide you a cheap professional DDO service. We have been running this service on hack forums for months and serving a few huge companies outside of hack forums. We DDoS huge company websites to small personal websites to private game servers. Our prices are based on how huge and protected the website or server is. We are open for short to long-term jobs as we are capable of handling the job for days, weeks, and months. So if you're uh, interested in a service of shutting down somebody else's website, the URL is ddosservice.org. And I found the, this channel had like four videos, a couple of these ads, and then there was this one video. Um, where Kuwapo himself, as far as we can tell, is, is counting his proceeds from his criminal online operations. And those are $100 bills. So it looks like a lot of money, but we have to remember that the value of the US dollar has been going down, so it actually isn't that much. <laughs> it's like 50 euros, I think. <laughs> One problem in particular, which has been growing just over the last months are ransom trojans. And ransom trojans are, from the point of view of the victim, a really shitty problem. Because if you get hit by a credit card theft, it's fairly transient. You will notice that there were extra charges on your credit card bill. And then you just call the bank or you call the credit card company and you complain and they will refund you. 
or if you get hit by a banking trojan, especially for home users, the banks will refund you because they don't want people moving away from online banking back to real world banking because that won't work anymore. But ransom trojans are a different thing because ransom trojans will directly, permanently hurt the end user. And ransom trojans, like most of today's Windows malware, is being distributed through exploit kits. Exploit kits like Black Hole. Black Hole, manufactured and sold by Russians, um, going by somewhere in the range of $2,000 right now. It's a uh, turnkey solution. You buy the kit, you hack a website, SQL injection, PHP, hold, what have you, and then you drop black hole onto that website and there you go. Now anybody who visits that website gets a perfectly normal website. It looks, operates normally, but they get a series of exploits launched at them. Um, and these exploits try to find a way in. They iterate through your operating systems, through your browsers, through your plugins, through your add-ons, and if you have anything which is unpatched or out of date, they will launch an exploit against that. And what you see here, I mean, this is the admin interface for Black Hole. This is what the administrators or the criminals see, statistics on who has been visiting the website with what system and what operating system and how many of them were infected. And the one thing that I find especially interesting in, in, in this uh, user interface for the criminals is that they have enough guys buying black hole and using it for criminal purposes that it's actually worth their while to run ads on the interface which is only seen by the criminals. So they have an ad network built into black hole where they can just ad show ads for the guys who are running it for criminal purposes. So this is a typical interface. This was found from a server which was running in Denmark. Um, and as you can see from the statistics here, most of the visitors on this Danish website were infected because they had an out-of-date version of Java. Java, 83% 80, of the infected users were running Java. Then an out-of-date Adobe PDF Reader plugin uh, for Adobe Reader 8 or Adobe Reader 9. Adobe 10 is actually much better here. Or an outdated version of Flash. But Java continues to be one of the main mechanisms people get infected on their Windows computers or now increasingly also on their Mac OS X computers where Java exploits are all already becoming a bigger problem. So what to do? I always say friends don't let friends run Java. Get rid of Java. That's what I recommend. I've gotten rid of Java almost three years ago and I haven't looked back. And now there are some caveats here. I know some of you have to run Java applications. That's okay. I'm talking about Java applets. In fact, I'm talking about the Java plugin in the browser. Drop the plugin from the browser. You won't miss it. Or if you miss it, if you have, I know some online banks, for example, run Java, or there are some in internal intra applications which re require Java. All right, then have a separate browser just for that. Have, I don't know, Firefox, which has the Java plugin, and you only use it for the sites which need Java, the two or three sites that do. And for everything else, you use another browser. So which browser to use? Depends. If we look at how big percentage of Chrome users get owned, just looking at real statistics from an interface of Black Hole, you can see that Chrome in practice, in the real world, is actually much more secure than Firefox or IE. And this probably is one of the reasons why Chrome is the most common browser on the planet. If it's not yet, it's, it's going to be very soon, which is great because IE was the number one browser for almost 15 years. The downside, of course, is that Chrome is done by Google. And by using Chrome, you are selling your soul to Google. And that is a bad thing. Chrome and well, Google is the big brother and there's not much we can do about it because it's really, really hard to try to avoid Google. I know, I've tried. It's really hard to stay away because the services are great. I need to just stop and think about it for a moment. Think about Google. Think about their infrastructure. Think about their data centers. Now, we run significant data centers ourselves for F-Secure. We have data centers around the world because we process somewhere in the range of 70,000 to 100,000 sample submissions every day. And processing here means we do cross-referencing, we run them, we throw them into sand nets, we execute them, we scan them with all possible antivirus scanners on the planet. So intensive stuff. 
We have sizable infrastructure, but that's nothing when you compare it to the infrastructure of Google. Just think about the search engine. Think about Google Maps. Think about YouTube. Just for a moment, think about YouTube. I once took the time to start going through the DNS namespace of YouTube.com, and I found somewhere in the range of 80,000 hosts, most of them cache servers in their namespace. They have just ridiculous amount of hardware to run YouTube, and that's just one of their services. So, obviously, it's a very, very, very expensive operation to run the data centers for Google. All right, so how much do the Google services cost? How much do you pay? How much do you pay for Google.com or YouTube or Google Maps? Nothing. It's free. All right, that's an interesting combination. A very expensive service to run, which is completely free. And then you look at Google's profits, and their profits are billions every quarter. And that's a funny combination. A very expensive service to run, which is free, and it's very profitable. Hmm. Which sort of explains to us just how valuable profiling us is. And you could say exactly the same things about Facebook. And it's sort of funny that 10 years ago, we were worried about Microsoft. We were worried about Microsoft 10 years ago. But Microsoft is the big brother, and we can't trust Microsoft, and Microsoft is, is the evil thing. I don't think anybody is worried about Microsoft anymore, right? It's Google and Facebook we should be worried about today. So you get hit by a black hole, your Windows computer is owned, you boot up Windows, and the next time you boot it up, well, it boots up, but your wallpaper has been changed. Your wallpaper in Windows has been changed to a wallpaper which explains to you that all your personal files have been encrypted with RSA 1024 with a unique key, and this includes all of your documents, all of your files, all of your images. And if you want to get your files back, please read the howtodecrypt.txt. And when you open up howtodecrypt.txt, it explains in detail that we went through your local uh, hard drives, we went through your shares, we went through the network, and we've found all the doc, XLS, PPT, PDF, JPEG, and TXT files, and we've encrypted them. You can't access your files anymore, and it's all true. That's exactly what they've done. And they've implemented RSA 2024 correctly, there's no crypto vulnerabilities we could find. And then they explain that if you want to get your files back, please pay $125 by contacting FileMaker at safemail.net and sending this unique key generated from the encryption key on your computer. And when you contact them and you email them, they're very responsive. You send them $125 over the uCash mechanism, they will send you back a program which will decrypt your files for real. So at least these guys are honest criminals, <laughs> right? And that's the reason why we haven't shut down the email address. Normally we would shut down an address like this, addresses used by criminals. We haven't. This address still works today. Why? Because we know there are victims out there who have to be able to reach out to these guys so they can pay them to get their files back. And as much as I hate the idea of paying these clowns, it's still the better option out of losing your funds. Because we've had people contact which they've lost their email history, no backups. They've lost their holiday pictures, no backups. They've had their company infected, encrypting local area network, and the backups are from last month. And these guys would, be, would have been happy to pay much more than 125. And of course, the solution here is backups. One, of course, solution is running something which would actually block this from infecting your system. But you can see how it's different from banking trojans or credit card theft, where you basically get the money back if you just complain about it. Here, you lost your files. But this is an extreme case. This, this is called GP code. It's very blatant. blatant. It actually tells you that we are the bad guys. We took over your computer. You have to pay us. There are other similar ransom trojans which are much more clever on how they play with the user. For example, you boot up an infected Windows computer and it boots up. But then it stops just before Explorer comes to the page. And instead of actually being able to access your computer, you get prompted by copyright violation. Copyrighted content detected. Windows has detected that the content you're using was downloaded in violation of the copyright. 
So you are now being sued by Motion Picture Agency and uh, RIAA and the Copyright Alliance. And they have a lawsuit against you. you can, there's a PDF file which has your information. Evidence list, they list all the MP3 files you have on your hard drive, all the movies, all the torrents, your IP history, your type of violation. And you can sort of see how people are uh, feeling a sting in their heart. And, oh shit, I do have some MP3 files on my hard drive. And you have only two actions. You can either pass the case to court, so you can fight this in court. Or you can press this settle the case in a pre-trial order button, which basically means you can pay and get a license for your MP3s and movies with the credit card. And no, this isn't really the MPAA or the RIAA or the Copyright Alliance. And, but I, you, can, you can see why people fall for this, because they know that these copyright agencies are playing really hardball with their, with their tactics. So it, it's plausible, but it actually isn't real. And the last example, you boot up your computer, it won't start up, just like with the previous Trojan, it stops in the middle of the boot, and then you get prompted by the FBI that they have found porn, child porn, zoophilia, and child abuse images from your hard drive, and your computer has been used to send out spam with terrorist motives. And to unlock the computer, you have to pay a fine, $100, right? And the interesting thing here is that if you take the very same computer out from the United States and you bring it, for example, to, to Germany, and you boot it up again with a German IP, then it's auf Deutsch. <laughs> Bundespolizei, Achtung, Achtung. And the price just went up from 100 euros to 100 euro, right? In fact, you keep taking the very same computer to different countries. It always changes. That's Spanish and Swedish, Luxembourg, um, uh, yeah, Italy, Greek, Germans, and France, right here. Office Centrale, whatever. I don't speak French. But in, even the Finnish version, they have a version targeting us Finns. And there's only five million of us, right? So we're not a very big target. Yet they've localized it. And the Finnish language is great. I mean, there's no typos or nothing. They've had someone do it professionally. And I have to highlight the fact that if you really, as an online criminal, if you really want to make 100% sure that the global law enforcement will go hunting after you, this is the way to do it, right? This is the way to make sure all the police will want to find you. And we, by the way, know at least two guys, Russians, who are involved in this case, so they will be going down. A couple of words about banking trojans and the money mechanisms there. Um, most of these are being run by Zeus or SpyEye, not nowadays SpyEye, which has become the leader in the field. And they are being sold online. Here's Kribodemon, or somebody using his nick at least, who's the guy behind SpyEye, another Russian guy, selling SpyEye. The prices you see here are uh, US dollars, or actually web money, but that's US dollars. So $2,000 for this base kit. Firefall injects, uh, uh, sorry, Firefox injects for another $2,000. Uh, RDP functionality for $3,000. Opera and Chrome form crappers for $1,000. But all upgrades are free. And the compatibility between the configuration file of these banking Trojans um, is great now. You can use the very same configuration file for Zeus and SpyEye, uh, where you can just configure which bank is being targeted, which has created a market for guys like these. This is Fakade selling Zeus Trojan setup. So he's not selling the Trojan. He's just selling the customization and tailoring of the Trojan against a specific bank. So, and it comes with a, they will find, I mean, you tell them, I, I have Zeus or I have SpyEye, I want to target this bank. And they will look at the interface, they will look at the different versions, they will uh, get an account in the bank, they will do online banking, they will tailor the scripts to work with that particular bank to do extra transactions or to change the account numbers on the fly when somebody's doing banking there from an infected computer. And uh, this is 500 euros. And it comes with a full 24-hour support. They will update the scripts if the bank changes the interface and all that. Great services. You don't really have to do anything at all by yourself. But let's skip and speak about governmental attacks. Now, like I said in the beginning, it's quite surprising that it has come to this. Yes, Stocks and Flame and Dooku are clear examples of this, 
But even the cases that we've seen elsewhere are, are pretty remarkable, like the fact that Iran wanted to spy on their own citizens. And they did that in, in very large scale by their um, government-owned ISPs, which were monitoring inbound and outbound traffic, which led to the situation that uh, dissidents and revolutionary people inside Iran started using encrypted services and started using email providers outside of Iran so that they couldn't be monitored. Services like Hushmail or services like just Gmail, because Gmail is always SSL encrypted and it's outside of Iran. And once that happens, Iran can't monitor the traffic of these dissidents because they can still intercept the traffic, but it's SSL encrypted. And they can't set up a fake copy of Gmail inside Iran or a, or a proxy for Gmail inside Iran to trap the traffic because it's SSL encrypted and the SSL certificate would fail. And Iran, as a country, can't issue a fake certificate for Gmail. Why? Because Iran doesn't have a CA. Why doesn't Iran have a certificate authority? Because we, the rest of the world, we haven't trusted them enough to give them a CA. So what did they do? Well, they hacked a CA in the Netherlands, DigiNotar, generated 26 rogue certificates, including a SSL certificate for gmail.com, hotmail.com, live.com, facebook.com, skype.com, hushmail.com, and now they were able to set up a local proxy or a local copy of these services inside Iran, install a fake certificate there, and now it would look perfect. Because these were now trusted certificates issued by a DigiNotar, which was supported by all the browsers in the world. You really wouldn't be able to tell that it wasn't really Gmail. You really would have to go and inspect the certificate chain, which very few people do. In fact, they were able to do this, we think, for at least two months until one guy looked at the certificate chains and started wondering that it's kind of weird that Google has gotten their certificate from a company in the Netherlands. And that's how it started unraveling. And by the way, we actually believe that people died in Iran because of this hack. Think about that. So when Stuxnet was found in 2010, and then when we later learned that it was already started as an operation called uh, Operation Olympic in 2008, it was a real game changer. I, uh, I just finished reading the book um, Confront and Conceal, which is the book by Robert A. Sanger, uh, editor for New York Times, which is the book which breaks the story where U.S. government takes the responsibility for Stuxnet which is interesting indeed. U.S. government is now I investigating who leaked this information. They're not denying. They're not saying that, no, it's not true. They just want to find out who leaked it. And of course, it wasn't leaked by accident. It was leaked on purpose. Why? Well, I don't know, something probably to do with the fact that it's election year in the United States. Call me cynical, but that's what I believe. But before we had this for a fact, we already knew that Stuxnet was targeting the Natanz nuclear enrichment lab in Iran. We knew it for a fact. How did we know that? Well, it's an interesting story. This was uncovered mostly by Ralph Langner, who did the analysis of the cascade structure code inside Stuxnet, because Stuxnet only operates if it finds this very specific cascade configuration of high-frequency power converters. And the configuration has to look exactly like this. There has to be four high-speed configurators by each other in this very specific structure, sort of like Fibonacci sequence, but not exactly. And if it doesn't find this sequence, it does nothing. And this is very unique. I don't have, know much about um, nuclear enrichment centrifuges, but experts tell me that this is highly unique. There would probably be only one place in the world which would have a setup like this, and that's what it was looking for. So the question becomes, does Natanz have a cascade of high-frequency power converters spinning centrifuges, or does it not? So how do we find out? How could we possibly find out if Natanz has a configuration of centrifuges which would look like this? Well, one solution is to go to this website, 
I don't know if you visit the website of the Iranian president very often, but if you would, you would find out that President Ahmadinejad has a collection of photos on his page. Photos of when he goes and visits places. And in 2008, he visited Natanz. And here's a photo from inside Natanz. And this photo is from the president's own website. Even better, there's a photo where he's walking by the centrifuges. These are the centrifuges, right? These are the centrifuges which blew up by Stuxnet. And if you look closely, you can see that indeed they are four by each other. That's interesting, but it doesn't tell us much yet because there's no way to calculate how many they are and you won't be able to see the actual cascade structure because that's just logical structure. There's nothing physical to see. So close, but not exactly what we need. But if you keep looking, you will find this photo. And these photos are taken with a Canon EOS DLSR, which means they've actually posted the original images, full resolution images on the website, which means you can actually zoom in. And if you change the coloring values here, that's actually what's on the screen. And then when you compare the sequence, you see that it's an exact match to what's inside Stuxnet. Can you believe that? We know it was Natanz based on the photos leaked by the the official website of the president of Iran. Quite remarkable. And by the way, the picture is still there. I just checked it last week. It's still there four years later. I actually went and tried finding out how long it would take me to find a copy of Stuxnet from open sources. It took me three minutes to find a copy of Stuxnet, just like that. So the risk of somebody going and actually modifying Stuxnet exists as well. It's not a very easy thing to modify. It's not trivial. It's far from trivial. But obviously it would be easier to modify it than to recreate it from scratch. Which brings us to flame. Now, I wanted to find out, wanted to find some image about flame or fire or something which would nicely ties in to all the talk here. The best image I could find was this. That's solid advice. Keep that in mind. If there's a fire here, first go to the outside. Ten tweet. So, not the other way around. So, I was contacted three weeks ago by Iran. I got an email from the Iranian CERT explaining that they've had this weird problem and now they're reaching out to Western security companies. And this is not normal. We don't normally get emails from Iran. We don't have much of, much of a customer base there at all. And that, as we now know, most of the infections were in Iran or in Sudan or Syria or Libya or um, other Middle Eastern countries. And even there, the infection, the amounts were very small. We're talking about a few hundred computers in the whole world, right? Very, very targeted. That's the actual main files. So that's the ones we initially found. We found more since then. It's sort of like a puzzle where we are missing some of the pieces. But what do we know about it? Well... We know it's highly unique. We know it's using weird certificates. We know that it connects to a series of websites. These are the control servers. Um, and many of these are being named so that if an admin is looking at firewall logs and he sees a machine connecting to NVIDIA drivers.info or, or something like that, they would probably think it's just some, you know, some update server. It's not. These are the servers used for traffic by flame. So we know it's huge, but that by itself means nothing, right? It's, it, it is big, but and it's almost all of it is code as well, um, 10 megabytes or so. It has a keylogger, so it collects your password, takes screenshots of your screen. That's not really unusual. Then it has built-in libraries for SSH and SSL and Lua and SQLite. It has an SQLite database built in, which we've never seen before in any malware. And it uses that to collect documents. It goes through your local hard drive, to, through your Dropbox shares, and through the local area network. And in typical organization from the local area network, it would find tens of thousands of documents, like doc, XLS, PPT, and AutoCAD files. It's also searching for AutoCAD. So it couldn't possibly steal them all. There's way too much in a typical network. So instead, it has this uh, system called iFilter, which goes through the files and takes excerpts. Like a couple of sentences from each, one sheet from each Excel file. 
and puts them into the local SQLite database and then sends it out through these NVIDIA drivers.info and other services. And then the attackers can look at the data which was collected and pinpoint, well, that's interesting, take that file and that file and that file, collect more files like these. It's sort of a back and forth service. Very interesting. It also looks through your JPEG files and gets the GPS coordinates from every single JPEG file on your hard drive and in the network. So it knows where the people are moving, where they're taking photos. Then it sees if there are any phones paired over Bluetooth to the infected Windows computer. If there is a phone, it will connect to the phone over Bluetooth. It supports iPhone, Android, and Nokia. And then it collects the address book from the phone over Bluetooth, puts it into the local SQLite database, and sends it out. And it's able to send out information even if it's a high security environment and there is no internet connectivity. It does this by infecting USB sticks that are used in the computers and copying the SQLite database on those USB sticks. So when that USB stick is taken out from the computer and somebody brings it home or takes it to a customer and puts it in a computer which does have internet connectivity, then it's going to send out the information. And it, even better, it gets back the instructions from the operators and puts them back on the USB stick, which are then brought back to the network. So they can still pinpoint the data collection, even if there is no internet connectivity, even if it's a high security, let's say, military network. Now we know it's connected to Stuxnet because one sample of Stuxnet from 2009 has one module, which is from Flame. So we know it's the same guys, which means we know it's the Americans, maybe with the Israelis. And then we learned that it replicates within the local area network by spoofing Microsoft updates. It does this by repurposing a Microsoft Terminal Server license certificate, which would be enough to get it working under XP, but not enough to get it working under Vista and Windows 7. So they actually took the certificate, dropped some critical extensions from the certificate, which means the certificate was now invalid. It, it, it didn't uh, match the, the uh, certificate link back to Microsoft root. So they forged it by giving it a MD5. It has the same MD5 hash as the original certificate, which is impossible, except it isn't, but if you do an MD5 hash collision. And MD5 hash collisions are a known attack, except they didn't use the known attack. They came up with a completely new, novel way of doing it, which has never been seen before. And if you look at the mailing list of cryptographic experts, they're also excited. Oh my God, somebody found this really cool way. This is going to advance our science by years. It's excellent. And you are sort of wondering like, who in the world has expertise like this. And even if they came up with this novel way of doing this MD5 hash collision, they still would require a supercomputer to actually do it. And they would still have to do it with a time window of one millisecond. So I'll just summarize that by pinpointing this press release from June 11th, that's two weeks ago. This is Northrop Grumman, one of the largest defense contractors in the world, I think the second largest in the United States. These guys, Northrop Grumman, Booz Allen Hamilton, Boeing, um, or SAIC, they all work heavily with the U.S. government, with the U.S. military, with the U.S. intelligence. And this press release from June 11th mentions that they just been awarded a multi-million dollar contract for cyber security services with an organization called Maryland Procurement Office. And I've never heard of this organization before. Maryland Procurement Office. They procure stuff in Maryland. I wonder who these guys are for real. Well, let's Google for them. Here they are. That's their address. Let's take a closer look. Where exactly is this? All right. I see. Maryland Procurement Office shares the office with NSA. So I'll repeat. Nuclear physics lost its innocence in 1945. Computer science lost its innocence three years ago. Thank you very much.